on behalf of the Hong Kong Trade Development Council, um, welcome to Selling to China and Throughout Asia, one of the four thematic sessions taking place this afternoon as part of the Think Asia, Think Hong Kong. We are here with you today in New York because we share a common interest. Put simply, Hong Kong and the U.S. like to do business together, and that's why we are here. Um, we even have lawyers. You know, this morning, uh, Silas Shaw was talking about, um, you know, everything is in Hong Kong, including U.S. lawyers. We have uh, uh, Hun Wong here. He is a very good international lawyer. I'm not charging you any fees for promoting you. <laughs> <laughs> the U.S. is Hong Kong's second largest export market behind only the Chinese mainland and our fifth largest source of imports. But as deep-rooted as our economic and trade ties are, we believe that our cooperation can only grow. And for good reason. As you look to, to the Chinese mainland and to the buoyant markets of Southeast Asia and beyond, Hong Kong can help show the way. Hong Kong is an international financial center and China's global financial capital. Our city's professional services sector is deep, talented, and uh, multilingual. Whether you are focusing on its top cities and looking at opportunities in its promising second-tier cities, Hong Kong is the natural gateway to mainland China and its vast consumer markets. You know, this morning the speakers also talk about the market growing at tremendous pace. You know, some going at, uh, you know, 50 percent or 100 percent growth a year. It's really tremendous. You know, we, we, sometimes we can't even keep up with the pace in China. Um, the consumer market is expected to grow under Chinese 12 uh, five-year plan now into its third year. The plan puts a priority on domestic consumption, on expanding the mainland's strong middle class and its fast-growing appetite for quality living. In that regard, Hong Kong plays a highly visible role. One example is HKTDC's signature-style Hong Kong shows, targeting mainland China's booming second-tier cities. Over the past six years, they've attracted more than five million mainland consumers, and the Hong Kong companies which had exhibited at these shows have established over 300 new retail outlets and appointed some 150 agents, franchises on the mainland, substantially expanding their penetration of the market. American companies that partner with Hong Kong companies can leverage on their established people and distribution network to secure a foothold in this booming market. You know, this morning, you know, um, somebody also raised about the high cost in uh, office rental in Hong Kong. But maybe you don't need an office in Hong Kong. All you need is a partner in Hong Kong. See, the real, real estate people in Hong Kong don't like me. Uh, but, you know, but, but it's one way to save money because we have all those talents in Hong Kong. Chinese consumers also happily come to us. In 2012, we welcomed over 34 million visitors from the mainland, most of them in Hong Kong to shop. In 2012, mainland Chinese spent over uh, 11 billion US dollars in Hong Kong buying consumer goods from all over the world. Why Hong Kong? Cultural affinity and geographic proximity play a role, so too does the absence of a consum uh, consumption tax. Our CE talk about, uh, or our speaker talk about, we, we, we do not have uh, VAT or sales tax, so that makes a difference. Uh, what, what, what is the sales tax in New York City right now? 8%? That's too high, right? <laughs> so, so if you do all your deals in Hong Kong, you save that. Uh, and what sells in Hong Kong probably will sell in China. So 
you can do your sampling and your, your, your tests in Hong Kong, and you can actually maybe distribute everything free in Hong Kong to the Hong Kong people. Anything sells that will sell in China. So, no, 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 no. everybody's shaking their head. They want to get, they get paid for what they sell in Hong Kong too. Uh, but, but more importantly, Hong Kong is a lifestyle trendsetter for mainland consumers. Uh, brand reflects lifestyle. And Hong Kong is the luxury shopping capital of the world. In 2012, Hong Kong was named the world's top destination for uh, luxury brands in the CB Richard Ellis Group's annual report on the business of retail. So it's why so many international brands and companies, including Coach, 3M, Gap, J. Crew, and Ashworth from the US have a presence in Hong Kong. Hong Kong is also the region's trade fair capital. At the Hong Kong Trade Development Council, we put on more than 30 international trade fairs a year, attracting a world of product and services, buyers and sellers. You know, many of those shows are actually number one or number two in the world. Last year, they included over 17,000 American buyers in Hong Kong to source with the world. They also counted more than 160,000 mainland Chinese buyers, which makes Hong Kong perhaps the world's best place to showcase products targeting the China market. American exporters are beginning to see the value in reaching mainland buyers through our fairs. Last year, over 350 American exhibitors took part in HKTDC fairs, and we hope to welcome many more this year. As China's transiting window to a world of brands, Hong Kong is your gateway. And with their rich experience and established regional distribution and retail network, Hong Kong companies are your ideal partner for tapping consumer demand in mainland China and throughout Asia. Today, we are honored to have with us five high-profile speakers from the U.S. and Hong Kong. They represent a wide range of sectors, from fashion and jewelry to wine, logistics, and legal services. They will share with you from every perspective on how to support your business in China and throughout Hong Kong and throughout Asia. I know it will be a rewarding session for all concerned. Thank you very much. As I was introduced, Joe Schoonmaker, I'm chairman of the New York District Export Council. Let me just mention that there are district export councils in every state, approximately 58 of them. We are advocates for small business, especially small businesses exporting. There are probably 25 million small companies in the United States, and only maybe 1 or 2 percent actually export. So in the good sense of the Department of Commerce, they started the District Export Councils a number of years ago. We've taken on new significance in the past four or five years. We call it the National Export Initiative of President Obama. So we're looking to help small and mid-sized companies assisting the U.S. Export Assistance Centers around the country. There are 58, if I didn't say that before, district export councils around the country. So, you didn't come here to listen to me. You got a great overview of China this morning. Now we need to get into the nuts and bolts. So, to begin the program this afternoon, I would like to introduce our first speaker. I think you have in your uh, information packets there uh, the, uh, the backgrounds of the, our speakers. So I will give the floor to Dr. Jonathan Choi first. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, actually, I'm not the speaker today. It should be Shelley, but she is not coming. Therefore, I'm talking on behalf of her. And her topic is about um, selling brains to um, China. But since I'm not an expert in that field, therefore, uh, my topic is selling products to China and uh, uh, Asia. Actually, I've, uh, I have been in New York for uh, uh, quite a long time. Uh, I'm very happy to be here again. I was here 25 years ago, uh, having my uh, cold storage facilities in Brooklyn and Queens, and uh, we sold um, seafood at that time. Uh, and now, uh, my topic today is we are buying seafood from U.S. I think uh, it's uh, very interesting. And uh, maybe, uh, the organizer would like me to talk more about the business, therefore I ex explain what uh, we have been doing in the past years. Uh, 
We are founded in 1957. We are a seafood company. Uh, my father founded it, and uh, we have been the, uh, doing the uh, uh, seafood business uh, for more than 50 years. We are vertically integrated. We own uh, fishing boats, uh, we have shrimp farms, and we export, and also we do distribution in the, uh, the world market. And uh, 50 years ago, we have um, uh, our trawlers in China, in the Hong Kong, Macau, uh, in, in Southeast Asia, including uh, Vietnam, Cambodia, Myanmar, all these countries. And we are selling to the world market, to uh, US, uh, Canada, Europe, and Australia. And in the US, when I was young, I set up companies in the New York, uh, Chicago, Atlanta, and Los Angeles. Therefore, US market is not new for me. Uh, but now, the time has changed. Uh, my uh, colleagues, actually I'm not in the business, therefore I was not invited to speak uh, for the food business. And uh, because our company has grown uh, uh, a lot and diversified in the past uh, 50 years, we are now in the finance, property, uh, media, uh, technology and infrastructure business. Uh, but still, food is one of our main items. Uh, we are selling seafood to uh, U.S. and also we are selling Vietnamese coffee to the New York market in Los Angeles. And uh, today I would like to talk more about the uh, seafood business that the organizer would like me to talk about. And uh, actually, uh, there's a big market in the U.S. in the past, but uh, the world has changed. Uh, my colleagues, uh, instead of selling uh, to U.S., now they're buying from U.S., from both the West Coast and the East Coast. Uh, we are now buying uh, many uh, delicious seafoods. For example, we are buying uh, Alaska king crab, black cod, conch meat, salmon, oyster, cream, and many more. Therefore, I think Hong Kong people, we love U.S. seafood because it's so delicious, good quality, and uh, uh, also it's a good hygienic standard. And uh, Hong Kong, as you know that, uh, Hong Kong is not New York, it's a big city. And uh, uh, it is a vibrant city and uh, very cosmopolitan that uh, we have been discussing this morning. Therefore, we have uh, many uh, good restaurants, from Chinese restaurants to Japanese, Korean, Western, you name it. Uh, we got it in Hong Kong. Therefore, we can sell a lot of uh, uh, good seafood in Hong Kong. And the U.S. is the Hong Kong's fifth largest source of imports of about 26 billion U.S. dollar in 2012. And 7% goes to food items, which includes seafood, meat, fruit, and agricultural products. I mentioned only seafood, but actually there are many more food items importing into Hong Kong, including uh, fruit, vegetables, and meat, and many more. And I, I just uh, uh, think that uh, Hong Kong uh, is, a, is a city of, of about uh, 7 million people. And uh, you just feel that, why we can buy uh, uh, so much uh, seafood? And one thing is interesting I would like to mention is uh, I'm the, also the Hong Kong uh, 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 Japan Business uh, Committee Chairman, uh, promoting the trade between Hong Kong and Japan. And uh, Japanese food is uh, very expensive, as everybody knows, especially uh, 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 years ago, the, the yen is so strong. And, uh, but Hong Kong is the first destination for Japanese food items. Six years ago, it was U.S. U.S. bought most of the products from Japan. But today, Hong Kong is the number one. It's very interesting. Therefore, uh, recently, in the past uh, two years, the Japanese um, uh, 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 Minister for Food and Fisheries, they lead big delegations from Hong Kong uh, to attend the trade fairs uh, organized by TDC uh, in, in Hong Kong. Uh, that's why Hong Kong uh, is a small city with 7 million people, but we can buy, we consume a lot of uh, expensive uh, food items. Besides uh, Hong Kong, another place which is in interesting is uh, Macau. Uh, people feel that, oh, Macau is a small city. How can you buy so many uh, expensive food items? But you have to remember, there are so many casinos in the Macau today. Therefore, they're buying a lot. Actually, we are transshipping a lot of products from Hong Kong to Macau. 
And uh, besides uh, Macau, I think uh, one important uh, uh, place that we cannot forget is the mainland, mainland China. Uh, for, as for mainland China, this morning, every people uh, have been uh, talking about uh, China has changed a lot. Uh, 30 years ago, when I was young, we buy the product from China and then transfer from Hong Kong to New York, to Chicago, to Los Angeles. But uh, not so many today. Still, of course, we are exporting to U.S. But instead, we buy from U.S., we buy from Canada, we buy from South America, and then ship back to China. Why? The situation in China has changed very much. This morning, uh, we are talking about uh, the Chinese policy has changed. In the past, they talk about export. They are talk about investment uh, to let the economy to grow quickly. But today, they changed. They changed uh, to have encourage domestic consumption. Therefore, this morning, we are talking about uh, consumer-based society in China, uh, how we can grasp the opportunity. And also, this morning, uh, there's one uh, situation that's quite interesting is, uh, Citibank's Mr. Bird, he said, uh, the urbanization of China, it took 30 years to urbanize 50% of the Chinese population. I think this is very interesting. When the Chinese people uh, have money and there's a big population, therefore they can buy, they can consume a lot of uh, food uh, from overseas. I think uh, today uh, in China, uh, the people is getting rich. They're willing to pay to buy uh, good food. And uh, also, the middle class in the China is coming up. You can see along the coastal cities like uh, Shanghai, Guangzhou, Shenzhen, all these places, the living style has been changing. They're looking for a uh, better life and uh, living condition. And also, they want to learn from the East, from the West. There were so many Western restaurants, Japanese restaurants, Korean restaurants in this area. Therefore, they need to import a lot of, of, uh, a lot of food items. And one more point I would like to mention is, uh, besides the big demand of food uh, for such a big population, food safety is also very important. You know, there are so many problems in China. Uh, they would like to import quality food from overseas. Therefore, U.S. Uh, seafood and U.S. food items, I think, uh, is a good source uh, of, of their demand. And uh, uh, in, according to the U.S. Department of uh, Commerce Statistics, let me quote you some numbers. In 2000, 2010, uh, China imported 6.8 million pounds of uh, seafood. In 2011, 7.8 million pounds. In 2012, imported 9.4 million pounds. Every year, it grew from 15% to 20%. Therefore, it's a steady increase in the import uh, of uh, U.S. Uh, food, uh, seafood into China. I mentioned only seafood, but there are many more coming in, like the agricultural products, food items, fruit, vegetables, many things that's important in China at the moment. So after saying so many things about um, the situation in Hong Kong, Macau, and China, and uh, one more place that I would like to mention is about is, uh, ASEAN countries. And I think it's a, it's a, it is the uh, Asian century, and uh, the living standard is coming up in ASEAN countries. There's also a big demand for good food uh, in the, these areas. And I think Hong Kong is also a place that we are well connected with them. So uh, you may ask a question, besides Hong Kong and Macau, why we need Hong Kong uh, to import uh, this uh, food uh, to China? This morning, we have been talking about uh, Hong Kong is very special. When you sell to Hong Kong, you are selling to China already. Hong Kong is part of China. Hong Kong is one country, two system, uh, but still, we are part of China. Therefore, when we come to Hong Kong, then it is China already. But the only point is, we have to go through the border uh, to, the, to the mainland. And also, Hong Kong is a place where this morning have been saying, the Chinese policy is, when you are going in or going out of China, you have to go through Hong Kong. Therefore, Hong Kong is a place where many Chinese companies is in the Hong Kong and many international companies in Hong Kong. Therefore, it's a place where you would like to do the business, especially trading. Hong Kong is a good place to come to. 
And uh, this morning, I think we're talking about the tax. Uh, for the Chinese uh, seafood, if you import in China, you have to pay 10 to 14 percent of import tax. And VAT, you have to pay 30 percent. In Hong Kong, it's zero. Uh, therefore, I think it's more interesting to uh, uh, go into Hong Kong. And uh, Hong Kong is a free port, and uh, I think it's much easier to get into it. And if you go to China, there are a lot of regulations and formalities uh, to get uh, clearance at the custom. And also in Hong Kong, it's a financial center. Therefore, getting the trade finance is much easier and more flexible in Hong Kong than in, than in China. And for Hong Kong people, since we have the uh, uh, same language, same culture, and a better connection with, uh, with the mainland, therefore many companies uh, come to Hong Kong and work with us so that we can go together to, to the mainland. Uh, I would like to mention some uh, new situation is, and at the moment we are trading in US dollar. Uh, but as you know that Hong Kong is a financial center, and also the Chinese government has um, made Hong Kong to be the offshore renminbi uh, center, renminbi offshore center. And uh, at the moment, about 90% of the trade, renminbi trade settlement is done in Hong Kong. Therefore, maybe in the future for the trading, it will be in renminbi. If it's renminbi, the trade settlement mostly is done in Hong Kong. Therefore, I think in the future, maybe there's a chance that uh, we can fix the price in renminbi. And uh, one uh, situation we have, I would like to mention is, uh, Hong Kong is not only a city. We are fully integrated with southern China. Uh, this morning, we mentioned about the uh, uh, Pearl River Delta area. We're talking about the whole area is what we call the uh, one-hour living zone. Because of the infrastructure, is so smooth. The high-speed train, the intercity train, uh, the freeway, it is, we have this seamless integration in infrastructure between Hong Kong and southern China. Therefore, the market that we're looking in not Hong Kong is the whole southern China. Therefore, uh, I think it is a really a big potential uh, 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 for, for the importers. And uh, one thing I would like to mention more is about Hong Kong. We do not only onshore trading, we're doing offshore trading. When you sell to Hong Kong, the product not necessarily go to Hong Kong or Guangzhou. It may go CNF to Shanghai, Tianjin, or Dalian. Whole China, we will we, we, we walk, walk through Hong Kong. Therefore, Hong Kong is a place that uh, you can do business onshore, but at the same time, you can do it offshore. To Shanghai, or at the same time, you send the product to Singapore, or uh, Bangkok, or Malaysia. So, how we are going to work together uh, 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 between Hong Kong and the U.S. company. Uh, I would like to share uh, one experience with uh, you that uh, we have been in China for a long time, almost um, 15 to 20 years, years ago. We set up companies in Shanghai, we import our own product and do the local distribution. But uh, we are a bit too early because we have the currency risk. And that today, renminbi is getting strong. Every day is coming up. When you hold renminbi, you're making money. But 15 years ago, when you hold renminbi, renminbi was depreciating. We have a big account receivable in Shanghai. It's difficult to collect the money, collect the account receivable. And at the same time, the account receivable was uh, renminbi denominated, and renminbi was depreciating. Therefore, we lose a lot of money because we are too early. But today, the situation has changed. Renminbi is strong. Therefore, with the strong renminbi, I think the uh, uh, buying power from China is increasing. And, but uh, you have to look for a good partner. Otherwise, if you have an account receivable in China, it's not easy uh, to, to collect back the money. So I just feel that uh, one more point I'd like to mention is uh, uh, today, uh, it should be shady talking about the brain name products. For the brain name products, I think uh, 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 most of the uh, uh, company's concern is about the trademark and counterfeit uh, issue. I think uh, this is uh, another issue that uh, is not my expertise, therefore I won't comment on it. And uh, I think Hong Kong uh, is a place that you can really uh, find a good partner, uh, to partner with you uh, to work together with Asia and China. And uh, for Hong Kong, as you know that, uh, for doing business, in trading business, there may be a risk of dispute. If it is in Hong Kong, maybe our lawyer will, will, will explain to you, uh, Hong Kong, I think we have a good legal system. 
I think we can settle it uh, in, a, in a fair way. And uh, when you are doing business in the, uh, uh, Hong Kong, uh, you can either be an agent, we can, you can get an agent uh, from Hong Kong, or uh, you can sell the importer or have a joint venture partner together. Why I mention GV partner? Uh, it's because Hong Kong has the uh, SIPA, uh, this mentioned by its chief executive uh, this morning. Uh, if you import the products in Hong Kong and you do the processing in Hong Kong, it becomes a Hong Kong product. Then I think there's a chance that uh, you, if you go to China, you don't need to pay uh, any uh, import duty. I think there are a lot of advantage uh, in doing business in Hong Kong. And uh, uh, if your company is successful, making uh, uh, big money, and if you want to get listed in Hong Kong, I think Hong Kong is also a good market for IPO. There are so many com successful companies in Hong Kong that get listed uh, in a few years' time. And uh, that's all I would like to talk about, the uh, food business in Hong Kong and how we can work together to the main market. And uh, since I'm also the chairman uh, of the chambers in Hong Kong, and uh, anybody would like to have some uh, introduction to the uh, partners or importers in Hong Kong, uh, you can come to me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for those uh, incisive remarks. We'd like to move right along with uh, Mr. Hugo Fowderman at this time. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Hugo Futavan. I am a third generation jeweler who basically grew up in the jewelry industry. And I've been working for about the last 15 years in New York City for a company called Windsor Jewelers which is a leader in estate and, uh, and estate and antique jewelry buying here in New York City. To make a difference between a regular jewelry store and whatever I do is we basically trade jewelry for its product, whatever if it's, we, we, we don't manufacture jewelry, we just buy and sell jewelry, diamonds, and, and, uh, and, um, and findings for, for jewelry. We've been going to Hong Kong for about 20 years and we've been developing a huge business in the last 20 years in, in Hong Kong, and we've been using Hong Kong as a very strong platform to reach out uh, Asian customer, European customer, and private customer all around Asia and everything. So to make you like, basically our, our business is really based today on, on the exhibition and trade show, and with Windsor Jewelers, we've been going all around the world to to uh, attend trade, trade show, who, who didn't used to be like that in the last few years, but in the, in the last 15 years, trade show became very important. And uh, Hong Kong has been offering the best platform to organize trade show uh, and to reach out uh, Asia. Uh, myself, I've been, I've been to Hong Kong more than 50 times uh, doing the show in March, June, and September, which are the, the, main, anti, uh, the main jewelry show in, the, in, in, in Hong Kong. And if I take the example of the March show, which is organized by the Hong Kong uh, uh, Development Trade, when I started doing the show about 15 years ago, the show was representing one huge hall in the convention center. Today, the show grew to a point that like the whole convention center has been taking place by the jewelry industry. And we are about to take over the, the airport convention center to have our conventions. That's just to give you an idea of how much in the last 15 years that the whole, the, the whole industry grow in Hong Kong. And I am here today because I helped the show to build that whole antique and estate section at the show. And I helped them build a part of their convention, uh, which is the, the antique section. Today, is, today represent more than like uh, 100 companies who come from all around the world and trade their, their, their jewelry. So what is Hong Kong and what, do, what in, in my business do we use Hong Kong as a, as a platform? First of all, it's, a, it's, it's very central in all Asia. And basically all my clients come from like anywhere from South Korea to Japan to Taiwan to Bangkok to India. And for them, it's very easy to come to Hong Kong and to do business together here in, in, in Hong Kong because it's kind of very central and it's very easy. The second point as well is, 
is the Hong Kong dollar, which is the, the currency over there, is very, it's a very, it's kind of set versus the, the US dollar. And, the, and there is no variation of, of money compared to the euro, or the pound, or any other money. The money always stayed the same. So no matter if you invest your money, you can be sure that if you, if you spend your money in Hong Kong and you come back six months after, it's going to be the same versus when you're in Europe. And you have to be very careful when you're investing your money or when you buy something, but between the, the day that you buy something and the day that you're receiving, the, you're receiving your, your, your product, it can be a difference in exchange rate. In Hong Kong, it's always stayed the same, which is a really great advantage. And the very strong point why we, why we love Hong Kong above and beyond the fact that it's a free trade country and everything, it's because in Hong Kong we were able, through the show, to reach out private customers, which is probably the only place in the world which allowed us as like foreign company to be able to reach out directly the private consumer in Hong Kong, because the show allowed them to, to access. To, to access. So, 15 years ago, when I started doing the Hong Kong show, we were doing a wholesale business, and we kind of reach out all the wholesale company, and we try and we introduce antique jewelry to. Uh, and when I say antique, I'm talking about European and, and U.S. antique antique jewelry, more than 100 years old, to the to the Asian market. And we were when we start working with like local Hong Kong dealers, we start working with a lot of people from 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 Japan and from other country, from the Philippines and, and Taiwan. And then through the years, we started seeing a lot, a lot of like private clients as well. So we start building a huge, uh, a huge contact list and a, and a huge business with all those private, with all those private customers who basically came to the show to buy their their uh, jewelry. And today we reach a point when, for my small company, we all, we have probably a mailing list of more than a thousand private clients who come every show I'm doing in Hong Kong. They, they're always here and they always come and, and they buy from me because they like the kind of product that, that, that we offer that they cannot find from local jewelers in, in Hong Kong City. And at the same time, in Hong Kong, at the same time, the whole industry is right here and for them it's, it's, a, great, it's a great amusing way to come and, 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 buy, and buy their uh, jewelry. Uh, the, the other part, it's uh, since 2008 and since the Closer Economic Partnership Agreement, which, is, which was made, put in place in 2008 and started in, in January 2009, it became much more easy for mainland Chinese people to basically come to Hong Kong and do business during shows and everything. So we, uh, since 2009, we saw a huge increase of mainland Chinese people coming in Hong Kong to do business during shows, and especially in our industry. And we started to first do business with, with wholesalers and jewelers in mainland China, and today it's even private, again, it's private consumers who's coming from mainland China to come shopping in Hong Kong during the show. And I think one of the reasons is because they really trust Hong Kong in terms of quality of their product, and Hong Kong has this kind of West, uh, as this kind of this Western image in like in the middle of Asia, and people trust Hong Kong. They know then when they, what product they're going to get in Hong Kong is going to be the real product. And when you start talking about jewelry or fashion or luxury product, there is a huge issue about fake fake product and fake bags and fake everything. And I think really Hong Kong offer a kind of trust that's the only that's the only city in Asia who can offer that, that trust and when you come to Hong Kong and when you buy your product in Hong Kong, you're buying a real thing. And private consumers feel very comfortable coming to Hong Kong and spend their money into luxury product because they really trust Hong Kong as a as a city. And and the show the show as as I was telling you the show is grows so much today that pretty much Half of our income lately have been done in Hong Kong, coming three times a year during those like con convention. It's been it's been really a, like a, a kind of a really big wave that we've been surfing for the last 15 years. And since the European crisis and since the the U.S. crisis, it's really good to have Hong Kong, which is which is very easy for us to access. The free the free zone allowed us to basically as a U.S. company to go there. And, 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 and we don't have any importation issues and we don't have any tax issues and everything. And, and it's a very easy way to basically do, do a business in, in, in Hong Kong. Um, I'm sorry to tell you. Uh, 
So my next step for, uh, for Hong Kong, so Windsor Jewelers today, uh, on, on, we basically raise our, 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 our business and we start buying brands. So our new thing is basically to, to, we bought brands here in the United States that we relaunched and we bought two of them. One of them is J. Caldwell, which is the oldest, uh, with Tiffany and Company, which is one of the oldest jewelry brands in the United States, based in Philadelphia. And another, and another brand called Marina B, which is reattached to the Bulgari, the Bulgari family in, in, in Italy. And our, our next step into, into, uh, with Hong Kong will be to basically try to promote those brands and use Hong Kong to launch those brands in, in, uh, um, in the Asian market. And we're going to use Hong Kong for that because it's, again, it's a place that people can, can trust. And that's going to be in the, in the near future how we're going to be able to like use Hong Kong to access mainland China and try to open store in Hong Kong and in mainland China using using Hong Kong or, or, or of our Asia of our Asian headquarters. And that's going to be what we're going to try to do in, in the in the in the near future. Uh, I guess that's all I have to say for now. So thank you very much to, uh, to having me here. And I let my next speaker. Thank you. A lot of great information to offer here. Uh, I'd like to introduce you now to Mr. Sergio Esposito. Thank you very much. Um, I own five businesses in the world and um, three of them sell to Asia. I have a uh, fine wine investment fund, um, European based, um, and one of our uh, most important markets is Asia when we um, exit our positions and sell wine. The other business is called Vino Holdings, which is a marketing and sales company that finds homes for uh, wine producers around the world, including Asia. And the first business that I started that dealt with Asia is called Italian Wine Merchants Hong Kong, which we um, started building the business plan in early 2007, and I believe we, we opened in, um, officially in January of 2008 when the world um, officially started to fall apart in the United States. And one of the reasons why we looked to Asia is because we saw this wave of terror, in a sense, coming in the United States and what might happen in the economy. And so when we looked globally, we thought, well, the market that screamed the most that it would be ready, let's say, to start being the next important consumers of wine would be Asia. So we did all of our homework and we built a business plan the way that um, people that have master's degrees and, and business degrees build business plans. They looked at demographics and they looked at trends and they looked at laws and they found that Hong Kong with its laws that were going to uh, change their tax laws um, was going to be the perfect place where you could introduce wine tax-free. Um, and of course, we understood that Hong Kong was the gateway to the rest of China. So we built a very interesting and um, uh, let's call it um, optimistic business plan. And I did my first trip with this business plan in hand. And one of the parts of the business plan that I worked on and I looked at very close is the client profile or your market profile, where you basically look at the market and or the people behind the market and say, okay, but who is going to be your client? Who are you going to be meeting with? And what should you know when you meet with this person? Because no matter what we say up here, understand that machines don't sell to each other. Human beings sell to each other. And so there's always a personal relationship. There's always an interaction that you must have with the other person. And so I started to profile the client that we would be selling to. And I understood that there was a tremendous amount of new wealth that was happening in Asia. And this new wealth created this demand and this thirst for luxury goods. And so I deal with luxury goods. My business is Italy, but it's old Italian wine and very expensive and collectible Italian wine or French. And so great, exactly what I was looking for. Consumers that are going to have a tremendous thirst, a tremendous amount of wealth and are looking to spend it. And in 1999, when I started my first business in New York here, the market wasn't very accommodating to wines of Italy, which is my specialty. But I thought, 
1999 when I started that business that I would change that. And I would do it because I understood the American consumer. I am Italian, but I had grown up in the United States, so I understood that the American consumer was ready for high quality Italian products. And I looked at the American consumer and the CEOs or the opinion leaders in the United States, and I thought, you know what, not very difficult. They're already drinking French wines, and they drink scotch, and they drink spirits. And I understand what appeals to an American. And so, you know, the business strategy was, was fairly easy. But then when I looked at the, at the Asian consumer, I understood and I kept hearing key words. One of the words was completely new. Um, they're in their infancy, which I thought was a great word because I never really heard it applied to human beings before. And I thought, what does that mean? They're babies? I, I don't understand. People said, no, no, they're, they're in their infancy. They're in the primary stage of people drinking wine. And I thought, Jesus, you know, I, I do a great job selling to um, to people in the United States, but here's a market where I can go and you have these really wealthy people that have this tremendous thirst for luxury and are willing to spend a lot of money and don't know a lot about money. It seems like a really quick way to get rich, very quick. So I took my trip to the United States with this Western mentality, in the, uh, to Hong Kong with this Western mentality. And I had set myself up with appointments and some people that I would call friends that we were emailing back and forth and, um, and they met me, and the very first night we had a very casual dinner, and I thought, you know, there's no other way to do this in Asia unless you commit yourself to educate, because these people, again, are in their infancy. And so you must educate, and you must give yourself, and you must do as much as you can to uh, promote yourself and, and to teach what wine and wine culture is all about. So I invited everyone to my home for dinner the very next night. And... Um, the very next night, I, I cooked a traditional Western meal where I cooked maybe five or six dishes, and I served those dishes over a three and a half or four hour period of time. And my Asian guests were tremendously sweet and very respectful and never let on to me that they were probably bored to death. Um, but they were very patient, and they uh, let me go through with my process. And then I thought I was going to be really fancy because I was going to show them what wine ritual is all about and wine culture was all about because, again, they were in their infancy. And, and I saw myself as finally, although, and albeit that I grew up in a, in, in a lower middle class um, family, I thought that finally I have arrived and, and I am the person that is teaching luxury here, um, an elitist in a sense in the wine world. And so I started with my wine ritual, and the first thing you do with wine is you, you cut the bottle correctly, and you, and you cut the foil, and you take out the cork in a certain manner. And then I took the wine, and I poured it a little bit into the decanter, and I started to swish it around because I was going to wash out the decanter. It's an Italian thing. It's called svinare. It means to, to just basically uh, wash out the inside of the decanter. And I poured that into the glass, and I started to swirl the glass, as you might see in New York all over the place and from glass to glass. And somebody, a young lady at the dinner said, that's great, but where is the glass from? And I said, I have no idea where the glass is. It's glass. I don't know. I mean, you're, I don't know. And she said, well, that, that's wonderful, but what is the glass doing for the wine? And I said, well, the glass, no, no, you don't understand, because I thought in my mind, of course, you're in your infancy. Um, <laughs> I'm washing the glass from soap so that it won't have a smell of soap. And they looked at me a little disappointed, but they had this beautiful smile on their face. And I went, okay, great. So I went on and I said, look, this is, uh, now you're going to aerate the wine. Um, and then we're going to start drinking the wine. Of course, this wine goes with this dish. And I had read with all my analysts that sent me a tremendous amount of material that Asians were great um, brand buyers. So I started to build a brand of the wine and what the wine was. So we went through dinner, and then sometime during the night they said, you know, this is all very wonderful, and these wines are great, and you're, and you're a great host, and you're a great cook. I mean, four hours to serve four dishes. You're really good. And, and I said, thank you, thank you. And they said, but what, why do you do this? What are you really interested in? And so I started to tell them stories about some of the producers that have moved me and, and the way that it inspires me and the way that it changes my life. And I said, you know, we don't really drink like this at home. And they said, well, how do you drink wine at home? And I said, well, it's very different. We, I don't go through all this stuff. I mean, we drink it almost as a health benefit first and foremost. And they said, really, tell us about that. And I started to explain. 
So somewhere during the night, one of them looked at me and said, you know, I have someone that you should meet, and, and I think I want to put together a dinner, so why don't you come to our house next time and we'll have this dinner? And I said, okay, perfect. So a few nights later, I showed up at the dinner, and uh, I was all prepared. I was going to educate them again because, um, you know, they're young drinkers in the world, and, you know, I, in my market research led me to one other thing, a story. It was a very ugly story that kept creeping up, which was that a very successful Asian businessman had closed a huge deal. And so he took Chateau Lafitte, maybe the most expensive wine in the world, and, and started to drink it because he asked somebody, what's the most expensive bottle in, on the list? And somebody said, Chateau Lafitte. And he said, me, I'll take it. And so he bought the Chateau Lafitte, but then halfway through the bottle, he didn't really like it. The bottle could have been cork too, do you know, something wrong with it. So he took Coca-Cola and he mixed with it. <laughs> he mixed it with the wine and he was drinking it. And so this story kept cre creeping up and all of my analysts would come back and the people that are helping me, my consultants helping me build a business plan, they go, did you hear this story? And then the next time it was Petrus. And it was a businessman that had just purchased his first plane. And then he took Coca-Cola and mixed it in Petrus on the plane. And then I heard the story again and this time it was Cheval Blanc, another great wine of the world. And the guy took Diet Coke and put it in because he was, you know, watching his weight. So this story kept coming, and, and, and as I went through the, you know, this night, I thought, well, Jesus, I, I guess the table, I should have brought wine because I'm expecting water, Coca-Cola, maybe Fanta, if, you know, the Europeans have gotten there. Um, and a woman walked in, and, and she had this beautiful dress, and, um, and so I said, wow, who's, who's this? And they said, well, she's the tea master. And, uh, and I thought, wow, that's great, a tea master. Tell me what a tea master does. And they said, well, she has studied for many, many years the benefits of tea and the rituals of tea and how to serve tea and how to prepare tea in a certain way so that we can enjoy it and she will guide us through a tasting tonight. I said, well, that's a beautiful dress. And they said, yes, it's a ceremonial dress. She gets to wear it because she has studied and she has um, passed and she is a master, so she gets to wear this dress. Do you have anything like that in the Western world? So I related it back to wine. I said, sure, I guess sommeliers wear a testaban that would maybe indicate that they've passed some courses, yes, and maybe indicate that they read magazines um, and know what score is very high. And they said, okay, great. And so this woman had her section and she had this little bamboo tray and she had all of these funny looking little teapots that a Westerner would look at and they look like my daughter's little tea sets. And I said, well, you know, tell me about the little teapots. What is she going to do with all those teapots? And they said, well, you have to understand, first of all, the clay comes from a very special place, a place near Shanghai, and it's a place that has um, this special clay, and it can only come from that place. Um, and I thought of Jasko Gravner, a person in the West that is making wines in Enfora from a very special clay that comes from Georgia. And the Romans would only go to Georgia to get their clay and then bury the urns under the earth. And he explained to me that the teapots had a very special purpose. They did one of few things. First of all is you only had one teapot for one type of tea. You could never mix them because the oils from the tea would be left on the clay pot and so you wouldn't text them. I see a few Asians nodding their heads, so I think I'm on the right track with the story, but if I make any errors on the ceremony, please raise your hand. <laughs> and then the other benefit was that the teapot was semi-porous and it started to collect some of the toxins. And thirdly, that the pot itself, the clay itself, helped the unification of the tea the oils and the liquid that it was poured with. And I thought, Jesus, that's, that's a lot what Yasko does because what Yasko does with his clay pots, and he has started this, this movement in the United States as he buries them and he will tell you that the clay itself amplifies the notes in a wine, amplifies through the chemical elements within the wine what the wine is about and it tells a story of the wine. So then the young lady started to mix these teas and she started to dance around with her little teapots and the water going back and forth and I thought, well, what in the world is she doing? Why don't you just throw the tea in and let it steep like we do for three or four minutes and then serve it? And they said, well, what she's doing is she's helping the wine dance. You have to understand it will soon be married with the water 
And what she's doing it is helping it court. It's a dance, it's a song that she's performing. Right? I mean, blow you over stuff. So the first tea was served. Gentleman explained to me this tea is very special because it is ceremonial and it's a very special product because you're new here tonight. And what this tea is meant to do is to lift your spirit because it comes from this plot of land that is so unique. It has such unique insects and animals on the plant and it has such a unique exposure to the elements and also the sun hits it in just in such a certain way that these tea leaves are the most prized in all of China. And so I thought, it's terrar. What you're talking about is terrar. We know that in wine. Plinio was the first person in the West to write about terrar. Terrar is about a sense of place. It's about the, the elements that you get from the, from the microclimate or the mesoclimate. And so I said, of, of course, someone must have studied Plinio's writing because Plinio wrote a natural history about 100 years before the birth of Christ, um, 20 years before he died in the eruption in Pompeii. And they said, no, I don't think so, because the tea ceremony um, and this special plot of land have been identified for eight to nine centuries before the birth of Christ. So a little bit before Terrar was discovered in the Western world. And so the next tea that was served was a tea that was going to help me um, through the night for all the dishes that were coming. Because what it did is it awoke in my liver and awoke in the chi in my liver. And so I thought, wow, Prosecco does that in Italy. Italians serve Prosecco because it's high in acid. What it does is it makes your mouth water a little bit, and that watering of your mouth tells your liver, get ready, somebody's gonna eat. So it starts to prepare you. The next tea helped you with digestion, and we got to the end where the last tea um, helped your um, um, intestines in a sense by creating heat in the intestines. And again, I thought of the wine world, and I thought of digestivi from Italy, which do the same, create heat in your intestine. And so I was very humbled by the experience that night and, and learning and understanding about um, uh, the tea culture and also learning the, the perspective that um, the, 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 the Asian who follows that culture must have when they're looking at wine and really realizing that we in the Western world with wine are probably in our infancy of understanding exactly what beverages are. So I went home that night, and I was a boxer when I was younger and maybe 30 pounds lighter. Um, and I did what a great boxer would do. Um, you bring a strategy and a plan into the ring, and then as soon as you get punched in the head, you throw that out, and you do whatever you have to to, uh, to win the fight. So what I did that night is I went home and I rewrote my strategy um, for Asia. And my strategy was one where I had forgotten a key element. A key element is that um, the human element and the human resource is the most important when selling. And so mutual respect and mutual understanding and mutual learning from each other would be and would have to be the only way that I could do business because it was the only way that I saw um, that I could really propel my company in, in a special manner, in a sense. And so by rewriting that personal, um, rewriting that, that part of the business plan, which is the personal element part, I looked at all of the different parts of the Asian culture and started to understand how advanced they were. From the tea ceremony, I started to learn about food and the way it was served and, and started to understand um, that there's a lot again, that we can learn from each other. And so in matching those two um, things together, um, we have now been in our, what, 2008, uh, fifth year in Hong Kong, very successful, selling to Vietnam and um, Korea and China and to most of the Pacific Rim, um, Singapore, of course. And more than that, we've made a tremendous amount of friends and are really growing as people. So that's my story. Thank you so much. We really learned something. I'd like to introduce you now to Mr. Albert Wei. Good afternoon. I unfortunately don't have any good uh, wine or tea story, um, but I, I, uh, I'm here to talk about SIPA, and um, 
I think many of you have heard uh, this, uh, what SEPA uh, is, but do you really know what SEPA is? So just by a show of hands, um, if I can just see uh, from the audience um, who is planning to sell goods into the China market? Okay. And how many are planning to sell their services to the China market? Okay, so we have more goods than services. I am a service person, so um, I will be talking more about service and goods. So let me, I'm going to use the slides that I uh, put together and um, let's see how I'm going to use this. Thank you. A little technical difficulty there. Um, my brother and I started a business in 2003, and um, what, what we uh, wanted to do is we wanted to create a company that would help our clients um, do their business and do what they do best, which is increase sales of their goods and increase their revenue and, of course, profit. So when we um, put together Vision Logistics as a logistics company, our uh, focus is to help company import and export their goods. So going into the China market is a must. Being here uh, in the U.S., how uh, a company like us were going to enter into the China market. The way that um, we decided to go into China was through the use of SEPA. So what is SEPA? If you look in Google, this is what you find. Is it the Center for European Policy Analysis? Is it the Canadian Energy Pipeline Association? Oh, I think you have heard it being mentioned many times today is a closer economic partnership arrangement. What does that mean? A little background about it. SEPA is basically a bilateral trade agreement signed between China and Hong Kong. It was signed in June 2003 and it was implemented in 2004. And it contains three areas. It covers the area of trade and goods. The most important fact that, that I would emphasize on this is that you can bring your goods into China with zero tariff if you partner yourself with a right company in Hong Kong that are able to um, go through the rules of origin. So again, uh, this is not my area of expertise because I'm in services. This is. The second item is the training services. Now, how did Vision um, use the training services? What, what we looked at when we um, created um, Vision and looked into entry into China, we said we need to have a way to get into China. So the way we looked at it is we saw SEPA and Hong Kong as the easy pass into China. So those of you that live in New York, you know what Easy Pass does, right? You don't have to wait online. You can go right through with Easy Pass, and you can get through the tunnel and get through the, to the bridge. So what we decided to do is if we were going to go into China, it would take a lot of processes, a lot of legal fees, and a lot of documentation. Um, instead of doing that, we partner up with a company in Hong Kong. The company in Hong Kong was a, a co corporation incorporated in Hong Kong, and it fell under the rules of SEPA, which allowed us to partner with them and allowed us to put an entry into China. We were able to open up an office in Shanghai, Guangzhou, and recently Macau, um, in a very quick and speedy manner. So it allowed us to get into markets that would have taken us 
probably over a year or, or longer. But from the point when we put in our application through SEPA and through the help of the Hong Kong Trade Development Council, we were able to get our process in and our offices in place within six months' time. So we were in there in operation within six months' time, which gives us quick market access. So I think many of you have heard over and over again, you know, why, why Hong Kong? There's a list of reasons. To, to us as a, as a logistics company, most important items here is the vibrant hub. As you know, Hong Kong is one of the busiest airport and one of the busy, busiest ocean ports. This is very important to us. Um, it was mentioned many times about the Pearl River Delta. People who don't know what the Pearl River Delta is, it's basically it's um, nine sub-cities in the Guangzhou province, including Macau and Hong Kong. There's a total of 120 million people just within that area. That's almost half the population of the United States. So it's a very forceful entry into China. And another thing is the five-hour flights to most of not only Asian countries, but I would say to the 50 percent of the world's population. So if you could go somewhere within a five-hour flight, that's from here to L.A., but if you're in our business, that five hours, you can enter into these major markets. It's very important to us. So obviously, Hong Kong to us is, is a gem. So, you know, my wife always, re, you know, remind me, gem, you, you, you got to know the four C's, right? Well, I, I came up with the four C's for Hong Kong. For, for us, the four C's of Hong Kong is capacity because of the air, ocean, and land capability. Communication, as many have you heard, uh, have heard, infrastructure is not of a problem. Hong Kong is multilingual, um, English, uh, Cantonese, Mandarin, you know, um, Sergio, Hugo, they're you know, all dealing in different parts of the world and able to communicate easily. Convenience, it's you know, Hong Kong, if you guys have been to Hong Kong, the MTR, it's great compared to the New York subway system. <laughs> they have a card that you can use to go to the subway and can buy, you know, items at 7-Eleven. I think we need to learn from them. <laughs> um, and finally, the culture. Hong Kong has a very dynamic culture, it's very sophisticated. Um, you heard from many uh, speakers, it's very friendly, uh, and no doubt is very business friendly. So how did SEPA benefit Vision? Well, as I said, we were able to partner up with a company in Hong Kong and allowed us quick entry into China. Two most important things that I think if people in the service business, you're interested in saving money, then SEPA is the way to do it. Through SEPA, we were able to get into SEPA by being able to enter into China with a lower initial investment threshold. It saved us nearly $1.5 million. To us, that's a big number. And I think that's an advantage that we all as business people would like to take. Another thing is the setup feed. Going through SEPA and with the help of the Hong Kong trade, and the Hong Kong trade and industry, we were able to do a lot of the work on our own. So for those who are attorneys, I'm, I'm sorry to say this, we saved a lot of attorney fee. Um, but we were able to process it um, fairly quickly, and in six months, we were able to get into China and, and open our market. Whenever the lawyer comes up, people start leaving. <laughs> which is understandable, because why do we need lawyers when we're talking about investments? Because they are no other than charging us a lot of money and telling us what not to do, but never tell us what to do. But actually, we are bad, but not that bad. I'm go now going to tell you something that if you are investing in China, in Asia, sometimes you do need 
people like ourselves to hold your hands. We charge you for that, though. And it's worth the money. I'm sorry, in my capacity as the uh, chairman of the Hong Kong Trade Development Council Professional Services Committee, please allow me to give you a bit of a commercial blurb about professional services, especially the legal profession. Enough is said about doing business in mainland China this afternoon and all the um, events uh, we heard from Albert, from Sergio, they're all real. We have all come across that before. But in fact, Sergio, I have a similar story about wine. About 15, uh, personally, first of all, I worked in Mainland, used to work in Mainland, I lived in Shanghai, lived in Beijing for a little while before. On one occasion, we took a group of business people to a restaurant and we ordered a couple of very expensive but lousy wine. I think it's some Bordeaux second, third label, but it still costs about a couple of hundred US dollars per bottle. I ordered two bottles, needless to say, without asking me, they mix it with not Coca Cola, not 7 Up, not Sprite. They mix it with Chinese herbal tea. <laughs> That is something new I never heard of. I was unbelievable, it's undrinkable. I look at the captain. He did not even ask me for it. Apparently, there's the most popular, trendy drink in China in those days. May I, sir? Yeah, 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 sir, please. Hello? So, um, if I could just add to your story, because, uh, you know, these stories go around, and, and obviously they're true, but somewhere along the line, I, I heard another great story, which is a Westerner says to a, a, an Asian, how could you mix Chateau Lafitte with Coca-Cola? Yes. And did it ever happen? And, and the Asian responds, it might have happened once or twice, but you've been putting milk and sugar in tea for over 100 years. <laughs> Shame on you. Absolutely, Sergio. On that wall, I truly believe in that because on that occasion, I really complained to the boss of the restaurant whom I knew quite well. I said, look, hey, look, your guys did not even ask me and they mix it with herbal tea. It's just absolutely not saying anything. Right? I can't pause it. Oh, he looked really serious. I'm so sorry, Mr. Wong. I said, look, so my people spoiled the herbal tea with your wine. I said, yes, okay. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Right. Now, to your missus uh, in mainland, you do want to come through Hong Kong. You have people like myself who spend a lot, we are all Hong Kongers, but we spend a lot of time working in mainland. For me, I personally start to, um, acting for clients going to mainland in the mid 80s. There was a short interruption because something happened in 1989. Otherwise, I've been shuttering between Hong Kong and various cities in mainland and learned how to do business with these people. And then we know how to, there's a lot of pitfalls to how to circumnavigate and avoid all these pitfalls. Funny enough, we are lawyers legally trained. Well, trust me, I'm a lawyer. But you, can trust a lawyer, but there are some other people you should be very wary about. Uh, just now when Albert asked how many of you are up thinking of investing in mainland, selling services, selling goods, selling your products, fine. I have come across, I've seen many, many times that people who are investing in mainland, somehow they will find a facilitator facilitator, some local guy who spent time uh, working in the West, including the US, then we go back to mainland, and they always claim to know, oh, trust me, give, it to, give everything to me, I'll look after everything for you. I know the people in the Ministry of, um, ministry of Trade, they will issue the necessary license within a couple of weeks, normally they wait a couple of months, maybe longer. And I know the people in the custom and excise, your import duty will be taken care of. I know the tax bureau people, no problem. You don't have to pay a lot of tax at all. All sorts of promises, you just have to be very careful about that because it doesn't happen. Because it happened to a lot of my clients, they end up coming back to us. 
asking for help, right? For example, this client of mine a few years ago, they start, they start importing wine. Wine is a big business in China now. And then they do, the wine knowledge has improved over the years. They do not just like Bordeaux French wine. They start to understand Italian wine, Australian wine, US wine. But then recently, the trend has gone back to spirits. You know, mainland Chinese, not all Chinese, mainly is some mainland Chinese, they love strong, fire liquid. Wine is good. Wine is good, but you have some snobbish value, right? I know exactly Lafitte 82, very expensive. Give me 10 cases. It looks, I'm thinking you can find 10 cases in this world. I don't care, just give me 10 cases. This sort of style. Now, deep down inside, they still like this strong Mao Tai. You know, this, you know, this liquid you pour into a car, they will go, that sort of thing. Now, they think that this is man, you got to drink like that. So they may serve you wine, but there's always a small glass somewhere with this fire liquid. I think some of you will have this experience before, right? You can have your expensive wine, but that is indispensable. The only trouble is recent years, especially in Guangdong province, in the southern part of China, They've come to realize that, for example, since President Nixon visited China, everybody has heard of Mao Tai in the West, okay? Because Mao Tai, wow, national drink, absolutely strong stuff, very expensive. The only problem is that the statistics show that the quantity of Mao Tai produced by the real Mao Tai factory, right, compared with the, just the total sale of Mao Tai in Guangdong, only one out of 30 odd provinces in China. So it's already three, four times of the total quantity produced in multi factory. That means statistically, every 10 bottles of multi, nine and a half bottles are fake. While the other half real ones are mixed with the other nine and a half. That's how it works, right? So all these, all these big business people mainland Chinese, they become cash rich, they start to understand, they start caring for health, and they don't want to drink anything alone. So they stop drinking local, locally produced strong spirit. But wine is key, as I say, wine is good. Wine is good, right? especially you have to entertain people, you need expensive wine. But they still have an urge for this strong liquid. So recently, Brandy, whiskey, become extremely popular in mainland because they go back and then they have, and they prefer to try brandy and whiskey rather than Mao Tai and equivalent uh, Chinese PRC produced spirits. Then one of my clients selling brandy into mainland and we all know that normally in brandy, Armenia, Konya, there's no year in brandy. But this particular client, French, of course, right? Uh, Armenia, they have year. It's a year to bottle the brandy. And then the Chateau Master will have hand-written signature and put in the expensive glass uh, bottles and then with oak box sent in. And it costs about a, thousand, a couple of thousand US dollars per bottle. Quite expensive, right? Send in. And then find the local facilitator come business partner. Ah, no problem, leave everything into me. Things will be absolutely fine. Well, things that will not fine at all because they could not get the proper license for a long, long time because it involved the uh, retail business is always difficult in mainland. And then number two, the big problem is import duties. The customer exact people say, that, I'm sorry, under the regulation, the rules, we have right to take sampling of your brandy, and because you have year in the brandy, right? Very good. You see, the most popular year start with 1949. This is the year of the revolution in Maine. Everybody wants that. And then they start buying 50s, because those people who were born in 50s are now big boss of big organization. And now get ready, going into 60s already. But the tax bureau, uh, the custom people in, insist that I want one bottle of each year, each year. <laughs> they said, look, wow, <laughs> that means we had to give you about 30 bottles. You know how much 30 bottles multiplied by 2,000 US dollars, right? That, that's already our problem. I don't care, otherwise 
no deal. So can you have one every three years? No, one every year, right? Well, actually, maybe that's including the number of people working in the office. I have no idea. But all this sort of thing, these are real stories, and you have to be very careful. Another thing is that when, and, and also, very often you know that. When you do other type of business, you want to merge, you don't find a local partner, you, 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 you do um, a typical merger acquisition type of work, nothing can replace really thorough due diligence. You really want to find out what they're doing, the market share, because it's not that they are all crooks, they want to cheat you. It's probably some of they were also very naive. And also there's a, you know, this is the same syndrome everywhere. You keep telling yourself you are good. After a while, you really believe that you're very good. So, you know, the biggest, according to American Bar Association, the most, the common causes for litigation in a cross-border merger acquisition deals is always representations and warranties, or rather the breach of the war of representation and warranties. But sure, was your PRC partner, hand in heart, Tell that, sorry, I did not lie to you. I truly believe that we are the best, right? But the trouble is that how you measure, because I have, well, where and wherever you go again, you will have the same experience when you do business in mainland. Whichever city you go to, they always say that we are the best in certain business, right? Always. I don't know. I, I, the common one I always quote is Bean Kurt. I have been to at least seven cities in China, claim that they make the best bean curd in the whole of China. So thank you. First of all, I don't think Western will be very interested in your bean curd. Number two, I have been to six other cities who came to produce the best bean curd. The question is, what yardstick they use, how they measure. But they truly believe that. So when they tell you they're the best, oh, we have a huge market share. We must have been, we must occupy 60% of the market share in China. <laughs> Don't believe that, right? Do some due diligence before you believe it. And then facilitator, really try, and don't trust that facilitator too much, right? And really, everybody can be bilingual. A lot of, they only have 1.2 billion people. You must be able to find 0.1% people who can be bilingual, right? Do not be impressed by that. And they all claim to know everyone from top to bottom. Again, put a question mark there. The next thing is non-disclosure agreement. <laughs> I think they breach every one of them. They disclose it to everyone. You have to be very, very careful. Exclusivity. <laughs> yeah, this is what you think. Don't be naive. They are talking to you exclusively, but then very exclusively, they talk to another person. <laughs> Equally exclusively. So again, you have to be very wary of that. And then, uh, I haven't even started going. This is my first. One, which is tell you, avoiding the spills, is that is that important thing. Do the groundwork, do not trust anyone, and then if you have a problem, do come to the lawyers who will give you advice. By the way, uh, the facilitator, if somebody really thinks that, leave everything to me, give me some facilitation fun, right? And then I will sort things out. Be very careful. We, they do have very strict law in mainland, and we here, from the U.S., we have SCPA, right, Foreign Corrupt Practice Act. That's where it has a long arm to catch you. So that is the uh, thing I want to tell you. Any other thing? No. Ethics. Business ethics, right? Sometimes they, again, I think you have to be very wary. Out of the blue, mainland China, they really, really, grown from primitive to decadent and missing the whole civilization in between. And you have to do business with these people and you really have to understand and they do want to make quick money and you do not want to be in that equation, right? You heard of this story before, don't want to offend anyone. Really in Guangdong, there was a client who was shown to a factory in Guangdong. Big plastic factory, two levels very clean, very modern, everything is automated. They're producing on level one, this is a group of business people visiting. They say, wow, what are you doing? So we're doing plastic products. The first level, we produce plastic nipples for milk bottle. I said, oh, really, good. So what do you do? Look at that, this is a new set of machinery, very clean, hygienic, untouched by human hands. So 
plastic resin goes in, plastic nipple go out, and then boop, you have one source. What is that? Oh, there's a needle, punch a hole on the nipple. Oh, oh very good, very important. Uh, this is the best way to produce. Then let's go up to the second level. Well, the second level, exactly the same machinery, but they're producing, well, they're producing condom. I said, oh, really? I said, okay. Exactly the same thing they do, plastic resin go in, compress, shoop, you go out, within a few seconds, there you are. But no problem, every now and then you have boop, the same noise. I said, look, why do you have that? I said, oh, we do put a needle, punch a hole there. I said, look, every four or five, we punch one hole. I said, look, uh, that is very unethical. How would you do something like that? I said, well, it's very good for our business on the first level. <laughs> right. We don't want people like that, right? And just, uh, I, I'm not, look, I'm also Chinese, right? I'm not saying that they all behave like that. Some do, <laughs> and they really genuinely believe that there's nothing really wrong with that, right? So be careful, because you do not want to fall within that sort of category. All right, next thing is that in Hong Kong, really, we are the best venue for if unavoidably disputes arise, come to Hong Kong. Hong Kong is a good place. It's part of China, and yet under the one country, two system model, we have our own independent judicial system, which is highly independent and highly efficient. And nothing can replace a good arbitration clause. When you put into a contract, always consider that. It is better than, but amazingly, even though your Lawyers keep telling you until it's blue in the face that, look, go for arbitration. Do not go for litigation. Statistically speaking, in China, number of litigation cases still far exceed mediation for some reason or another. Why people still go to litigation, nobody knows. But trust me, always choose arbitration. And Hong Kong is one, one of the good places you can consider. And the good thing is that it's very close to mainland, it's part of China anyway, and it's easier for people to come to Hong Kong and we have a good legal system to support and we have good lawyers. I think I've done longer than I need to, so thank you very much. Distinguished speakers, we're now going to begin the question and answer session of our discussion. Uh, the way we'll handle this is it will be led by our moderator, Mr. Schoonmaker. Um, we'll first take the questions that you passed out that were written down. We'll address each of those. And when we're finished with those, if you have further questions, please raise your hand. And one of the staff members will come by with a microphone and we'll address your questions then. Mr. Schoonmaker. Thank you. I seem to have an awful lot of questions here. Let me start with one that, uh, with our attorney here, we're talking about two different legal systems. If you're a small company setting up business in, in uh, Hong Kong, do you need to know both the Hong Kong legal system, the Chinese legal system, the mainland legal system? And what if you're doing business in Vietnam or in Taiwan? Do you have to know all of them? Uh, yes. Uh, in Hong Kong, we... We do have lawyers from different jurisdictions, and if you come to Hong Kong, you can go to a one-stop shop. Of the, according to American Lawyer, the leading legal journal, of the top 100 law firms in the world, 65 of them have set up a branch in Hong Kong. And we have law firms from, the, from at least 50, well, 40 to 50 different jurisdictions in the world. So it covers everything. And in Hong Kong, you have a lot of mainland firms, mainland Chinese firms setting up in Hong Kong as well. So you come to Hong Kong, normally one firm will be able to offer other um, legal advice of other jurisdiction to you. Since we have the lawyer speaking, uh, one question that just came up, I think it's all on everybody's mind. How can a small business sell its products in China and avoid piracy of its intellectual property? Should I even ask that question? Uh, I'm somebody? Yes, uh, take our insurance cover. <laughs> That's what I can say. Well, you know that we can take our insurance, IP insurance covers. Uh, it's very difficult. I, I must say that uh, you will very often, big companies will, will choose mainland China selling their, their off season, the second cut, you know what I mean? 
because you never send the latest in the mainnet, because it will be unrealistic to think that no one will copy. If, if it is a good sale, they copy within days, I think, which is quite amazing. They, I must say that they are very, very good at that. They, they, they fake everything in mainland. And have you heard of this? They have fake eggs, right? And it took me a long time to figure out how, I said, look, to produce a fake egg it must be very expensive, right? I have seen a lot of Easter eggs and, you know, toys eggs. They got to be more expensive than the real egg, right? Do you agree? Right? How can you fake an egg? Until, actually, I, well, earlier on I mentioned I live in Maine, I live in Shanghai, I live in Beijing. I, but I never, never crossed my mind that it happened like that to ordinary people. You must have bought a lot of eggs in your life, right? Thousands of them. The way we buy eggs, we go to the supermarket, it comes in a dozen, half a dozen package, right? In a box. With an egg. It was shell there, right? But in mainland China, you buy an egg, the egg will come off the shelf because they keep the shelf. The shell is worth some money. So they put, you want to buy two eggs and then they give you two eggs in a plastic polythene bag and you carry it home. <laughs> that is a different thing. Of course, that you can fake anything or you can put whatever it is inside. So it took me a long time to figure out. But anyway, yes, for IPA, protection is a problem. Um, always keep something in your back pocket. Don't give them everything. And if not, then take out insurance cover. Uh, if you ask me, sorry, let's see who asked the question. Well, in China, we've done every, absolutely everything to stop faking. We respect intellectual property rights. And then you can rest assured that you come to mainland China, we will look after your IP rights. And we have enforcement agents who stop people from copying your products. That's the official line, by the way. <laughs> I had a friend of mine travel to China about six months ago, and he was being offered iPhone 6s. Well, they don't even offer an iPhone 6 here yet. And I asked him, could he get a cheap iPhone 5 for me? He said, would you like an iPhone 6? And I said, no, I don't think so. We have a lot of uh, iPhones called Pineapple instead of Apple, but they have more functions than Apple. <laughs> Uh, question for uh, Sergio. What re resources did you use to get your data for your client profiles in China? Um, for the client profiles, we looked at, um, well, first of all, I, I hired um, a consulting firm um, that did, um, they did a, a tremendous amount of work from us, but I, I, I don't recall the name of the um, uh, consulting firm right now, but what they did is um, they looked at all the basic data that you would have in terms of consumption, um, both in volume and also in um, types of wine and then also at price points. Um, and then they also looked at the consumer and the profile of the consumer and, and whether the wines are being drunk off premise or on premise within restaurants. Um, so that was about the data that we had. And then of course we looked at uh, stylistically what kind of um, wines and. And, and, and we tried to figure out from there if we could build a, a flavor profile that, that, um, that was more, let's say, um, uh, adaptable to the market. And, and really none of the data made a lot of sense in, uh, in, in hindsight. A similar question for the entire panel. What can a U.S. manufacturer do to ensure the selection of an effective Chinese distributor? What can a U.S. manufacturer do to ensure the selection of an effective Chinese distributor? As a member of the New York District Export Council, people ask me, how do I pick out a distributor in Hong Kong or China? And I think it's similar to the question that I had asked before. Uh, yes, the uh, Trade Development Council may be able to help, but there are, having said all the bad things, they're bad but not really that bad, some distributors, if we get onto the internet, um, some are quite big because of their huge chain markets in the mainland, in China. Uh, they are pretty trustworthy. Some of them are, depends on the, what product is talking about, right? For food beverages, for example, there are one or two really ginormous um, companies. They are quite trustworthy. Now, again, ask around before you, you hook up with these people. Do more research.
some consultancy firm will be able to give you more background. And, and if I could also add, I think one of the other cultural differences is that um, Western companies tend to be very private about their business size or the business scope of business, but Asian companies, I found that even individuals behind a company will readily tell you exactly how much business they do, what the dollar amount is, and all the managers, how much money they make, what kind of cars they drive. So it's not as um, secretive as it is in the West, and, and so you can do better due diligence because of that. Okay, the next question is for Mr. Fowderman. What are the opportunities for U.S. diamond and jewelry companies in Hong Kong and China? What product niches could U.S. companies fill? Uh, what's product? What was the beginning of the question? Diamonds? Uh, what are the opportunities for U.S. diamond and jewelry companies in Hong Kong and China? What product niches could U.S. companies fill? Uh, in my particular case, we basically sell everything from like small and small jewelry to very high-end diamond. And during in Hong Kong, I have clients who's going to spend like few thousand dollars on buying like a small diamond ring, and like very high-end private who's going to spend more than a million dollars in investing in a big diamond for for investing. So the the, the panel of clients that I that, I'm, that, that Hong Kong allow me to reach. It's, it's the whole range, and it can go from like very small to extremely, extremely big. So it's just a matter of what your company sells and what, and what products you, you're trying to reach. But in my, in my particular case, my company has like the whole panel from very small to very high, and we're basically reaching all markets. So if you come to our, 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 our booth during an exhibition, you're going to be able to find, uh, I think right now we have a diamond for like more than $4 million, and we have a little piece of jewelry for like 20, and we sell anything in between. So any, any market. But in mainland China, they have rules uh, governing jewelry it's just in China, for example, you cannot sell jewelry in a big shop. So they have they limited to a small shop, no more than 300 square meters, something like that. Which is, well, I suppose you don't need a lot of space for diamonds, right? So yeah. it doesn't take up a lot of space anyway. But but it's true that it's true that like, actually today a lot of people kind of investing in diamonds as like an investment because if you if you reach into like fancy color diamonds, not the white diamonds, but the yellow and blue and pinks that everybody been talking right now, it's a lot of money to invest at the beginning. But the market it's always growing, and and it's like investing in, into a community. So a lot of people investing into diamonds and less investing in the in the in the stock market today. So I have a few clients like that who are investing. In Mr. Ford, Hugo, you're not going to talk to my wife. Every time she buys diamonds, she, tell, she claims to be an investment. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Uh, regarding SEPA, I have uh, three questions here uh, from Mr. Y. Could you have an established Hong Kong company on your own? Could you? Oh, could you? I have to read people's handwriting, so excuse me if I hes uh, hesitate for a moment here. Could you have an established Hong Kong company on your own and still access SEPA? Uh, yes, you can, but uh, under the SEPA rule, you have to uh, have your company in operation for three to five years before um, you can um, use the SEPA benefit to enter into China. So that's why it's probably better to partner with somebody that's already established so that you can have that immediate entry. In the form of a question, SEPA is for products made in Hong Kong, Hong Kong country? Uh, or, well, I've got to read the handwriting. SEPA is for products made in Hong Kong. Country of origin is Hong Kong. Well, he's asking is the country of Hong Kong origin do you, make the, do you make the product in Hong Kong? Well, again, there's over 270 uh, items that's uh, under the class of the products. And um, from what I understand, under the rules of origin, there's, um, it, it depends on the product. The product can be made in Hong Kong, or it can be a product from another country, but it has, as uh, long as it has value added, um, uh, labor costs, uh, along with R&D costs, in which uh, it, it, it uh, uh, comes out to about, I think, 30 percent of the FOB value, then it can qualify as an origin uh, of Hong Kong product. Then it can enter China um, 
um, duty free. Another question in the same vein. China, well, this is very uh, sort of a mega question. China is a very daunting country from a logistical standpoint. What is the future plan to be able to move goods around this vast country? Almost anybody could answer that, but it's to the CBER representative. Well, logistically, um, China has grown um, all along the, uh, the coast, and the coast has become very expensive. So the recent move is everybody's moving, the labor force is moving inland, right, because of the manufacturing is moving inland. So logistically, um, we have to move along with the labor force. So um, I think we need to move more inland um, because the manufacturing now is starting to go more inland because of the uh, higher costs on the coast. I have a similar question, and I'm uh, very interested in the answer to this. Uh, it's open to the entire panel. The Internet growth in China is impressive. How is the delivery of goods sold online working in China? Do you have a UPS or a FedEx that runs around and does this? Yes, in China, you, the, the Taobao is the biggest net. Uh, these days, most young people will do the shopping by, you know, watching the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the internet, serving around the website, and you can buy practically everything. Then the same uh, Taobao has their own delivery company, which is basically covering 80% of mainland China that you have guaranteed delivery within 24, 48 hours most. Even in Hong, in Hong Kong, we buy a lot of things on the internet from mainland China. They will have it delivered to no more than 48 hours, normally within the first 24 hours. And they do have their own, uh, well, their answer to our UPS and working quite well. Yeah. Sorry? Shenfeng that's the name of the, um, well, it doesn't mean anything to our audience, but they do have their local, uh, couple of them, uh, nationwide uh, courier service. And this all added to the, uh, the, 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 the internet uh, sale company. But one thing I want to point out is that, compared with the US, sale on the net in mainland at the moment is not even it's not even two percent of or one point, not even two percent, and you can imagine the sky is the limit, right? If everyone in mainland China are using net to do their purchase, this is a huge area for you to consider, and there are so many new investors in main uh, into China selling their products on the internet. A uh, question for the entire panel. What key piece of advice to companies looking to introduce, what key, key piece of advice would you give to companies looking to introduce a new brand into Hong Kong and Asia? That's a big question. <laughs> Speak to the consumer. <laughs> uh, come, come to trade shows. <laughs> like, I think the, 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 Trade show, whatever industry you are into, is the best bet to introduce a new brand to a new industry. And, and uh, as I was saying during my, my speech, like the Hong, the Hong Kong, the, the, the HKTDC offer a wide, like I think the Hong Kong Convention Center has more than 32 conventions all year long in different fields. And uh, the best bet to introduce a new brand to the, to, to the market is to come to one of those shows and attend those shows and exhibitors and try to be as much creative as you can be to, to get yourself out of the whole panels of, of things. I think it's the best idea to introduce a new brand to, to new market. Yeah, we have for information on trade shows. Let me just mention, go to export.gov, which is the U.S. Department of Commerce, and they'll have a list of many, many of the trade shows around the world. Yes, I interrupted somebody. Uh, we, we have a lot of clients that are, you know, that are um, selling in the U.S. market. But um, as they are going into the Asia market, they realize that what is being sold in the U.S. doesn't necessarily work in Asia, um, even you know, in terms of sizes. You know, a large here um, can be an extra, extra large in Asia. So, um, you know, you really do need to know your market. Um, 
next question. How long do you feel it takes to get real traction in Hong Kong? And I would assume the entire Asian market. And do you feel customers are sophisticated and or loyal to brands? What was the last part to that question? Well, how long does it take to get real traction in Hong Kong? And I, I'm assuming the Asian market. And do you feel customers are sophisticated and or loyal to brands? Um, if, if I may, my experience there has, has taught me that um, much like New York compared to the rest of the world in a sense, Hong Kong has the opportunity of um, right now seeing almost every product that is available in the world and it's being offered to them. Um, and it's been um, that way for a few years, but for a relatively short period of time. So um, that builds sophistication more than anything else because they have the opportunity to literally be almost the first in the world to evaluate something. And um, it, in addition to that, because they understand that they are a gateway into China, because some of the thinking is that the, the mainland Chinese will go to Hong Kong, see what's happening, see what's hot there, and then bring it back to China as will the rest of, um, of Asia, in a sense. And, and that's a very important factor in Hong Kong. But because of that, um, they have the privilege of almost being market makers, in a sense. And that, with it, brings a tremendous amount of, of um, sophistication. But consider, from, from a lot of the companies that we looked at, if you take um, some of the fashion brands, um, Massimo Ferragamo had told me that he had um, set up more Ferragamo stores in Hong Kong than he had in Milan, Paris, New York, Rome, or any other city in the world because, because um, part of branding is really making yourself accessible as often as possible and putting the brand in front of people. And of course, branding, branding just basically breaks down to market recognition and what the market, when they see that symbol or when they see that, what they, they, they associate with that. And so consider that in the United States, for instance, if Barilla Pasta wants to put a new pasta on the shelf, and I don't even mean a new product, I mean a new shape of pasta. Instead of the spaghetti being long, spaghetti being a little shorter, a little thicker, whatever it is, they usually allocate about $14 million to creating that brand for that special cut of pasta in the United States because it's very expensive to get shelf space. Now imagine in, in Hong Kong where you don't have a lot of space, every product in the world is being offered to you and every business in the world wants to do business with you. It starts to get a little bit the entry fee to get at the shelves or to get in front of the consumers starts to get really expensive. And I think we talked about the real estate first and foremost has gotten super expensive in Central, much more than New York, um, I found. But also just um, uh, doing business um, there, there is an entry fee that is a little bit more expensive than other places. Absolutely. In short, Hong Kong is a good showcase to mainland China. A lot of people would like to come to Hong Kong. They think Hong Kong starts a trend. So whatever is trendy, they come to Hong Kong and take a look. And then, so, so you are absolutely correct. If, you, if things are sell in Hong Kong, it will sell in China. They do follow Hong Kong. Yeah, also, also what I was saying earlier, that like Hong Kong, it's, it's, a tr it's a trusty place in terms of when they come to Hong Kong, they feel that they're going to buy the real product versus buying it in mainland China, which could be like a whole fake store with the whole fake product. At least in Hong Kong, when they come here, they, they, they are uh, reassured that they're going to buy a, f a, f a, f a, a real brand, which is also... And, and if I may add, if you go to the airports um, throughout Asia, if you look at all the stores that are being, um, you know, um, uh, in, in all the airport shopping uh, area. It's like a shopping center now. You have all the Fifth Avenue names, you know, at the airport. So it's, you know, it's you all the same name. Kong. You could live in Hong Kong Airport if you want. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> a good place. I have another question here that's difficult to read, but I think it's a good question. Do industry associations exist to facilitate contacts, such as for medical, packaging, printing, and a few others? Obviously, the Hong Kong Trade Development Council would probably be one of the key contacts, but do uh, any of these uh, associations exist for specific products? 
Yes, absolutely. Everything. Wine, you have Wine Merchants uh, Association, and then jury, certainly you have several jury uh, societies, uh, um, association, etc. You get onto the internet. And if you have trouble, come to the Trade Development Council. We are more than help, uh, happy to help you. I have another question on SEPA, and I was introduced to SEPA for the first time today, so excuse me if I'm reading this incorrectly. Are any import permits required to buy goods to, I guess, to sell to China under SEPA? Am I? Well, the whole purpose of SEPA is to, uh, through SEPA, you can bring products into China without having. Um, you know, pay duties, uh, but in terms of import license, that's a separate thing. I don't think that has anything to do specifically with SEPA because uh, importing to China, all importers have to have specific license for importing um, certain goods. So I think it's, um, it's, it's not totally related. It's based on the product you're importing. Basically. Yeah. Uh, my last written question here, I'm, again, not too sure what it's saying. How important is Guangxi? And then, it sa then the individual says, knowing the concept of entering China through Hong Kong. So I'm not familiar with Guangxi. Is I don't know his relationship to the Guangxi. 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 Uh, yes, this is a term we've been used for many years. Actually, it was a term supposed to be trained some 20 years ago. I can tell you that Guangxi doesn't mean anything anymore. There's a bit similar to what I've explained to you earlier in the facilitator, but he's the man who's buying you Guangxi. But then, as I say, we don't believe in that anymore, and China has moved on since then. Guangxi is something 20 years at least before. And these days, pretty things are pretty regularized, and then you just better follow the proper step. Do not believe in Guanxi. Well, okay, you can have a short term believe in Guanxi, but you better, if somebody promised to give you a license, you make sure that you get it very quickly, because normally within six months, that chap will end up in a dungeon. And you will never find him again. All right, so do not trust in Guanxi, because you may, it may drag you into trouble anyway. I don't understand. Okay, we have questions for Jonathan Choi. Okay. Okay. Uh, one question here: We currently manufacture goods in China, but we don't sell them there. What will we need to do to be able to sell the goods we make in China to the Chinese market? Dr. Choi, maybe? Oh, question again? Ah, question again. We currently manufacture goods in China, but we don't sell them there. What will we need to do to be able to sell the goods we make in China to the Chinese market? I think, uh, first of all, um, uh, if it's foreign company sending a factory in China, you have to make sure is this for re-export or is for local uh, uh, sales. And uh, if it's for re-export, I don't think that you're allowed to sell in China unless you applied uh, that uh, you have to pay uh, the tax. For example, for the machinery that is important, uh, if it is for, uh, for re-export, you don't need to pay any tax. Uh, but if you, it's, it's for the local sales, and I think you have to apply for uh, a special permit or you pay tax before you can sell in the, uh, in the local market. Uh we had mentioned before about possibly taking a question or two from the audience, or should we wrap it up? Would there be any questions from the audience? The gentleman right here, please. And if you'll speak up loudly, because, uh, well, you do have a microphone coming. Now, question to you for SEPA. You said uh, somebody asked a question about importing. For SEPA, is you are adding about 30% of the value addition has to be done in Hong Kong before it can be imported into China. Is that true? Is that what I understood well? Yes, approximately. But, you know, again, uh, this is, um, it has to meet the rules of origin, according to Hong Kong. It gets a little complicated with the, you know, with the formula, but it's about 30% of the FOB value of, of the goods that you're bringing in. 
So it can be imported from anywhere in the world as long as the validation is done in Hong Kong. Yeah, yes, it's, it's correct. It's um, anywhere in the world. Could be any product as well. Um, as long as it's within that 270 uh, class of items. Is jewelry one of them? Is jewelry one of them? What is it, I'm sorry? Jewelry. Jewelry, I think it is, yes. Yeah, okay. Them, sure. Thank you. Any other questions? And also, one, one more, one more question. Oh, yes. Hold on. Please. Question to you. As you said that, you know, uh, you need to set up a separate company if you are manufacturing and to sell there. What is the difference between having a trading company in China and having a representative, a representative office in China? How would you distinguish between two? Mm. I have an office in Hong Kong uh, and I have an office in the US as well. You cannot do business. Sorry? If, if it is a rep office, you're not, you cannot do business there. You but need you, to sell up a, a, a local company registered in the China before you can do the business. If it's a trading company, it all depends on what of item you are trading, whether you need an import license or import permit uh, before you can do the business. Mm -hmm. So a representative office is just managing the business there? Is yeah, that if rep office is representative office only, you cannot do the business. But uh, having a representative office there, can they still hire people from outside, oh, yes, yes. work permit and all that? Is there a... Yes. If you have a rep office, then that you can uh, 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 get the employees, you pay for it, but you, you shouldn't have income. You can pay the expense. You remit the money into China and then pay the expenses. So you have to... You there is some get amount we need to invest so that we can pay the expenses. Pardon me? It means some amount we need to invest in China for to pay the expenses what are incurring there for the rep office. I, I can't catch your point, yeah. So how would, if there is no income, it's just a representative office and management part is happening? You usually, for representative offices, you uh, get the money from outside of China, put it into, for example, in Beijing, you have a rep office, then the, uh, your head office from overseas, for, for example, is from Hong Kong, you put the money in the Beijing office and you pay for all the expenses, including the employees. And you are not supposed to get any income or issue any invoice from that uh, representative office. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions, please? We have some distinguished uh, speakers here. Okay. Thank you. Uh, when, sorry, when eBay first went into China, the, uh, they used the internet to sell goods, uh, but they had difficulty collecting uh, payment because many banks wouldn't recognize checks from other banks and there was no electronic system to do that. Can you describe that in today's environment as to how payment is made via e-commerce in China? Uh, before... I don't know if I can answer your question, but when, when eBay moved into China, we, we were part of the group of people who tried to basically sell jewelry on eBay in, in, in mainland China and everything. And our main problem, and it was about, uh, we have to say it was 2008, 2009. And our main problem was actually the shipping, which was, how can we guarantee that the package, package is going to be delivered? And neither FedEx, UPS, or DHL can guarantee knowing knowing what they were shipping can guarantee that like we, we we're going to be able to deliver the the, the, the package so it can it kind of by like four or five years ago it kind of disappeared so I, I don't even know what's going on today but what stopped me to start selling jewelry through eBay in mainland China was the whole shipping part we cannot be guaranteed back then so I don't know if today it kind of evolved or something or if someone can know the uh that is what I mentioned earlier to Taobao, or is one of these, their biggest uh, internet uh, um, C2C, uh, B2C to sale. And then the Alibaba uh, has um, coincided with that, and they offer guarantee payments. But that is very exclusive to what well, you have to join that network before you can get guarantee payment. And then the, the C, the consumer, you have to open an account deposit money into their account so that they can buy on the internet. And then the minute they decide to buy something, of course their account will have automatic deduction. And that's the seller will have guarantee payment. And of course, subject to a commission. Oh, they cannot get a guaranteed delivery. What well, depends, as I say, the, the one I mentioned, the delivery is very pretty reliable. 
don't think it uh, ever failed. In fact, it was uh, uh, apparel, they guarantee the size doesn't fit, they will actually change that. Within, they will come back and collect it and change another one, which is uh, quite amazing. I just want to share something what I found out here that may help that lady as well. There is this company, Agenta, something, you know, they have a payment solution with Union yeah. Pay, some debit card or something, so it may help yes. you. They yeah, collect money yeah, exactly. first. It's written in the back. Hey, we have a question from the, in the back. Yes, um, my question is, I would like to ask uh, Mr. Fonteman and uh, Mr. S. Posito, um, for your experience in China and Hong Kong, do you find out duplicated your product or design? Like your product, your wine selling in China, do you find a lot of duplication there somewhere? Some people, like... I, I would say that um, in my industry, um, fabricating wines is a um, tremendous issue. And there was a case here in the United States where a young gentleman supposedly um, came to the United States and pretended to be the son of a very famous or extremely wealthy Asian um, with an unlimited expense account and really took over the market in a sense here in the United States, the collector's market, with opening these tremendously old and valuable 60, 70, $100,000 per bottle that he was opening almost nightly and um, basically almost duped the whole industry. And then, of course, he was buying these collections of wines and then selling them at auction, the same wines that he would open with a journalist a week or two before. So fast forward, um, the FBI about a year ago arrested him and claimed that he was actually buying old, empty bottles of wine, filling them with different types of wine, recorking them, and then kind of doing PR and selling. Now, I don't know if that story has anything to do with the fact that he was Asian, because he also had um, a, a whole network of other people that worked with him here in the United States, um, and the crime was committed here in a sense. But I can tell you that, that that is a problem that happens all over the world, including Asia. It happens in Europe. We, we see fake bottles of wine, and so it's an international pro problem. Um, and in Asia, I guess, where the consumer isn't um, so used to the products, um, I have seen a, a fair share of fake bottles um, in the marketplace there. Do you, do, you, yeah. good, good. do you also use distributor in China? I'm sorry, I think it's, it's an echo. Do you use a distributor in China? Uh, w w no, we sell to the collector's market through, um, I believe that they would be called more agents than, than distributors in a sense. Um, where we have certain agents that we work with and then work with distributors, and the wines go to either um, uh, restaurants or clubs, hotels, and then private individuals. Good. And uh, Mr. And for, for us, you know, business, like having, let's say, if I take an example of like a piece of jewelry which is carty or not carty, there is two things. First of all, no matter, what, no matter if it is carty or if it's not carty, it's still gold and diamonds, so you still have an intrinsic value on the piece which, which uh, for sure, uh, a piece is going to be signed is going to be worth much more, uh, much more money. But it's, it's as well, it's, it's, our, it's our reputation and it's actually our job and it's my job to, when I, when I buy something, to make sure that it's a real one. And we have, we're, let's say, on the extremely high-end pieces, we, 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 can, we usually sell them with certificate. So if you're talking about antique and estate jewelry, I go back to Cartier or to Van Cleef and I try as much as I can to get certificate to be able to prove the origin. And when I'm arriving in Hong Kong and I'm trying to sell the, the, the species, is, is my reputation and the reputation of, of my company who makes the whole difference. Meanwhile, I've been doing the show for like myself for more than 15 years, the company for more than like 20. So we kind of gain a reputation in Hong Kong of selling real product and everything. And it's, it's a long run. It takes, it takes years to build that reputation and build, and build your clientele. And, but when, when, I, when they start trusting you after, it's, it's, it's very easy to, to keep going as long as you do a good job and everything. But I, I understand it's a problem. But it's more um, uh, when, you, when you get into juries, it's not, uh, you, don't, you don't see much, let's say, uh, you will see high-end pieces kind of being like old, old pieces of jewelry are going to be fake. You're not going to see new ones. 
because th there's like gold is expensive, diamond is expensive, and and let, let's say the, the premium that you get on like a boutique line having a brand is not as much as you would expect today with the gold price and everything. So nobody really copies. They, they, they're going to try to copy a fake watch or something like that, but not really jewelry itself. Watches is a completely different different business, but jewelry, they don't, you don't really see copy, copied jewelry. Thank you very much. And uh, Mr. Wong says, uh, sounds like a very scary doing business in China. Um, I just want to add on that since you uh, gentlemen took advantage of trade show in China or Asia, like a Canton Fair or Hong Kong TDC's event, and there's a, if there's a manufacturer here or you want to sell into China, I want to offer you another um, resource because the U.S. government, Commerce Department will offer lots uh, resource grants and monies for you to go to the trade show as well. So if you think of it, you can go to your local commerce department or stay, find out those uh, resources for money. And also there's a grant also for uh, food industry to marketing your product in China as well. So just FYI. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, that will include, I think, well, Okay. Yes, one more. Okay. Sorry. He's got a mic. Just have a uh, quick questions for Albert. It's uh, regarding the like you know those uh, sipa there. Like uh, from my experience and also my customs experience, like you know uh, ex export to China regarding the import and li import license is really difficult. Some of the like I uh, say cable or electric uh, goods there, they are subject to those uh, 3C compulsory or those are uh, automatic import licenses. So that CPA is a totally different concept of those uh, import license, different story, right? Because CPA is more like for duty, like a zero duty rate. And then import license still, import license still will be required. Co correct. It's two different things. Import license and um, CPA is two different things. Okay, got it. Thank you. Yeah, well, actually, what happened is that in, in mainland China, whatever you import, right, especially raw materials, you need import license, and there are designated import companies which hold quotas for the different manufacturers which require the raw material to import. CEPA is different, right? CEPA is under WTO, Section 3. WTO, all members, Hong Kong is one unit separate from mainland China. That, Everything you offer should be multilateral, not bilateral, right? That's the whole idea of the WTO. But under special circumstances, they do allow two units, well, states, but in, in the case of Hong Kong, it cannot be because Hong Kong is part of China. But the two units can sign a closer relationship just between you two for a limited time. You cannot do it forever. And that's super. So that in 2003, where Hong Kong was suffering from SARS, from chicken flu, everything, and mainland China wanted to help Hong Kong, and they chose 270 different types of products, and as well as professional services, like insurance industry, to go into mainland without getting the special license to get to set up a company to offer insurance. For example, insurance have been very, very closed industry in mainland, but under CIPA, they allow you to go in. So it is more service oriented than products, other than watches, jewelry, there's limited product that you can import into mainland without having to obtain an import license like the rest of other industry. Well, I'd like to I'm thank sure, you all I'm very sure much. I'm sure you can talk to the, uh, so, sorry, I'm sure you can talk to one of the uh, Hong Kong Trade Development Council um, personnel and be able to get more information on the product, on your product. Okay, I've been asked to wrap this up. I want to thank you so much for attending for over two hours. I hope it was very informative. Let's thank the panel. At this time... We'd like to thank our moderator, Mr. Joseph Schoonmaker, and all of our distinguished speakers. Please join me in giving them a round of applause. Thank you so much.